Hello. In this session, we shall discuss the human herpes virus group. This presentation is recorded as a PowerPoint show, which would allow you full control to flip through each slide and listen to the audio recording with each slide. The aims of this session are to help you develop an understanding of the infections caused by human herpes group of viruses. And by the end of the session, you should be able to discuss the following aspects of human herpes viruses. Types and general characteristics. Clinical presentation, including systemic and oral manifestations. Complications associated with human herpes viruses uh, infections. And finally, the principles of diagnosis and treatment. You would know from your previous knowledge that viruses are submicroscopic infectious agents and they lack a cytoplasm a nucleus or the cellular organelles and therefore are not classified as prokaryotes or eukaryotes they basically obligate parasites which require a host cell to survive and replicate um, viruses could be based on uh, the nuclear content of the viruses could be based on DNA or RNA. The viruses in the human herpes uh, group consists of a double-stranded DNA uh, which is protected by a protein coat known as the capsid which is in turn surrounded by an intermediate protein coat known as the tegument and the outermost boundary is encased in a lipid bilayer and from the lipid bilayer, you can see uh, glycoprotein spikes, which help in the uh, fusion of the viruses with the host cells. The whole particle is known as a virion. And once the virus infects the host cells, the viral DNA is transcribed to messenger RNA in the nucleus of the infected cells. Now, human herpes, viruses are DNA based viruses and in contrast to RNA viruses such as HIV or SARS-CoV-2 virus which causes coronavirus infectious disease uh, the DNA based viruses uh, the infections with DNA based viruses are generally easier to manage because they have less ability to mutate and development of vaccines against these viruses is therefore a bit more straightforward. For herpes viruses, humans are the only natural reservoirs and the herpes viruses can reside for life within the infected individuals and cause recurrent infection, particularly when the individual is immunocompromised. The term herpes is derived from the word herpene in Greek, which means to creep, because these viruses are capable to survive in a latent phase and get reactivated. There are eight main groups of herpes viruses. Type 1 and type 2 are known as herpes simplex viruses. Type 3 is varicella zoster virus. Type 4 is Epstein-Barr virus. Type 5 is cytomegalovirus. And then you've got the less common ones type 6, 7 and 8 and we shall discuss each one of them in detail in the next slides. As discussed earlier there are two main types of herpes simplex viruses type 1 which generally causes infections above the waistline and type 2 which causes infections below the waistline however with changing sexual behaviors and oral sexual practices it is possible for type 2 herpes simplex virus to involve the uh, organs and tissues above the waistline and vice versa for type 1. The initial infection by herpes simplex virus is known as primary herpes and its pattern differs in children and adults. So in children, the most common pattern is what we call herpatic gingival stomatitis. So inflammation involving the gingival and oral soft tissues. It's usually seen in young children from six months to five year age group and is the most common pattern of symptomatic 
herpes simplex virus infection and 90% of the cases are due to type 1 herpes simplex virus. The incubation period is 3 to 9 days and is characterized by abrupt onset of fever with cervical lymphadenopathy, anorexia, irritability and sore mouth. One of the characteristic features of herpes simplex virus infection in children is vesicle formation, so fluid filled blisters involving the epithelial tissue. Now you must be able to appreciate the difference between vesicles and bully. A vesicle is a fluid filled blister involving the epithelial tissue and is usually less than a centimeter in diameter, whereas a bulla is a fluid filled blister involving the connective tissues and is usually over a centimeter in diameter. And at some point you will learn more about vesicular bullous lesions of the oral cavity and herpes simplex virus infections are included in the differential diagnosis of vesicular bullous lesion, uh, lesions involving the oral cavity and the other ones being uh, uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid, pemphigus, bullous pemphigoid, uh, bullous lichen planus, erythema multiforme, etc. So remember herpes simplex is one of the vesicular bullous lesions. So vesicle formation, numerous vesicles form which later on ulcerate and they affect both the movable and attached mucosa. As discussed in the previous slide, primary herpes in children is characterized by hepatic gingivostomatitis, so erythematous painful gingivitis uh, and also multiple ulcerations resulting from rupture of the vesicles. So you can notice that the labial gingivae are inflamed and there are multiple ulcers involving the labial mucosa and the labial soft tissues. You can see the labial frenum is involved as well and you can also notice multiple ulcerations on the dorsum of the tongue. Uh, in addition to intraoral lesions, there may be lesions involving the lips and satellite perioral lesions in some cases. Generally these ulcers uh, heal within five to seven days but may take up to two weeks depending upon the severity. Now what is important is that self-inoculation of fingers, eyes and genitals may occur in the children and it is important to maintain good personal hygiene. In this slide you can note satellite lesions involving the lips and the perioral tissues. So this is what we call primary herpatic labialis when the primary herpes in addition to gingivostomatitis intraoral lesions uh, it involves perioral soft tissues. Herpes simplex virus infections in adults uh, the primary herpes is characterized by herpatic pharyngotonsillitis. Uh, initially there is sore throat, fever, malaise, headache etc. The classical acute viral infection symptoms and the oral manifestations start with vesicle formation followed by ulcerations as in children. However, these ulcerations primarily affect the tonsillar region and the posterior pharynx. Now both in children and adults by the time the patients present to you, you are unlikely to identify any vesicles because these are usually quite fragile and rupture quite quickly leaving the ulcerations. So when the patients present to you, you are more likely to identify ulcerations as opposed to vesicles. Most uh, primary herpes infection in adults are caused by herpes simplex virus 1 but infection with type 2 in, in, is increasing primarily because of oral sexual practices. Now if you look at uh, histopathology specimens from the oral mucosa, the first slide shows a vesicle. You can clearly see um, a fluid filled uh, space in the 
oral mucosa, the white space indicates presence of fluid, but you can note that the surface layer is still intact. So that's the stage of the vesicle. Once the surface layer of the oral epithelium is breached, that leads to ulceration. And you can also note uh, presence of fluid in the spinous layer, which is now separated from the basal cell layer. That's the basal cell layer. And this is because of breakage of desmosomal attachments in the spinous layer of the oral mucosa, a phenomena we know as acantholysis. So that is the basis of vesicle formation, which later on ruptures to leave the ulcerations on the oral mucosa. As the viruses cause acantholysis in the spinous layer, the nuclei from adjacent cells, they fuse forming multinucleated giant cells. These are virally infected multinucleated giant cells in the spinous layer of the oral mucosa and are also known as Zank cells, spelled with a T, T-Z-A-N-K, where T is silent. So Zank cells are multinucleated giant cells in the spinous layer of the oral mucosa following acantholysis. Following primary infection, the herpes simplex virus resides in the trigeminal ganglion and uses axons of the sensory neurons to travel back and forth to the peripheral skin and mucosa, causing recurrent infection. Reactivation of the virus may be triggered by exposure to ultraviolet radiation, trauma, old age, respiratory infections, menstruation, malignancy, leading to recurrent herpes simplex virus infections, which manifest in a number of ways, which we shall discuss in the next slide. One of the most recognized pattern of recurrent herpes in adults is cold sore or hepatic labialis. And you would be familiar with this. It can be seen in 15 to 45% of the population and is usually triggered by ultraviolet radiation or trauma. It is characterized by prodromal itching, burning sensation on the lip, 6 to 24 hours prior to the development of lip lesions, which tend to ulcerate. Uh, you would know from your PDSC policies that if one of your patients presents with a cold sore, you're not going to undertake any active treatment in that appointment. And you should postpone the patient uh, until the lip lesions have healed usually in 10 to 14 days. And then you bring back your patient for operative treatment. Rarely recurrent hepatic labialis can be a bit more severe and can present with hemorrhagic crusting of the lips. Uh, and your differential diagnosis might include other lesions associated with hemorrhagic lip crusting such as paraneoplastic pemphigoid and erythema multiforme. In addition to hepatic labialis, recurrent herpes can also present intraorally uh, as ulcerations involving the keratinized mucosa, which tend to heal within 7 to 10 days. So recurrent intraoral herpes simplex is also a pattern of recurrent hepatic infection. Finally, recurrent herpes simplex can also present as cutaneous herpes. Uh, another term for this is herpatic whitlow. It primarily involves the skin on the uh, hands, thumbs and fingers. And self-inoculation in children particularly is a major risk. It can also be observed in health personnel working without gloves or those using inappropriate cross-infection control uh, in clinical environments, even if they are wearing gloves. And because the virus resides in the nerves, it may lead to paresthesia in the skin of the involved region. So hepatic whitlow is another pattern of recurrent herpes simplex infection. In addition to the primary and recurrent herpes infections, herpes simplex viruses are also associated with a number of other lesions, including 
erythema multiforme, aphthous ulcers, and some oral carcinomas. Uh, and you can read a bit more about these in your self-directed learning. The next virus in the human herpes group is the herpes zoster virus or type 3 human herpes virus. The primary infection with herpes zoster virus seen in children is known as chickenpox and is characterized by multiple itchy vesicles on the face which can also lead to facial scarring. And after the primary infection, the virus resides permanently in the dorsal spinal ganglia. And reactivation of the inf initial infection with varicella zoster virus can lead to shingles. There's a 10 to 20% lifetime risk of reactivation with prevalence increasing with age. Reactivation of the virus can be seen in patients with immunosuppression, cancer, those on cytotoxic cancer chemotherapy or radiation therapy, alcohol abuse, old age, and sometimes following dental manipulation. Secondary infection with herpes zoster virus is known as shingles and usually involves one or more branches of the trigeminal nerve. It is characterized by, the, by pain in the area of the epithelium innervated by the affected sensory nerve and this is accompanied by fever, malaise and headache. Shingles involving the face is characterized by unilateral cluster of vesicles on the facial skin followed by ulceration and crusting. And you can see that on this occasion the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve is involved and as I mentioned previously it is unilateral uh, you can also note that the lesions are extending to the ear. Uh, scarring is not unusual, but usually uh, the lesions settle down within two, two, two to three weeks in otherwise healthy individuals. Sometimes the classical vesicles and crusted lesions may not develop, but still the patient experiences severe pain and that is when we call it zoster sini herpati, that there are signs of shingles without the obvious clinical signs of vesiculation. If you ever see a patient of shingles, the facial lesions are extremely painful and may be accompanied by intraoral lesions, uh, usually unilateral vesicles, which later on ulcerate and tend to scar. So intraoral vesicles and ulcerations are also possible with shingles. Maxillary involvement is most common and may lead to devitalization of teeth and possibly even bone necrosis. In addition to the facial and oral lesions, ocular lesions are a major concern because involvement of the eyeball may lead to permanent blindness and involvement of nose is an early indication uh, for referral because uh, periorbital lesions uh, can involve the eyeball and there is a risk of blindness. So you must refer your patients to appropriate medical colleagues for further management. As mentioned before, the lesions associated with shingles tend to heal within two to three weeks and the pain usually settles down. However, if the pain lasts for more than a month following herpes zoster infection, uh, especially if left untreated, we label it as post-herpatic neuralgia. So post-herpatic neuralgia is a form of secondary neuralgia in the head and neck region, which follows herpes zoster virus infection. In contrast, trigeminal neuralgia and vagoglossopharyngeal neuralgias are primary neuralgias and the neuralgia may be due to destruction of the large myelinated fibers which are infected by the herpes zoster virus and generally herpetic post-herpetic neuralgia is managed with a combination of ibuprofen entonox which is nitrox nitrous oxide tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline notriptyline 
and topical lidocaine. Another remarkable manifestation of herpes zoster virus infection is Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Uh, this usually follows uh, herpes zoster infection involving the ear, so lesions involving the external ear and external auditory canal may lead to hearing defects, vertigo, and are accompanied by facial paralysis. So this combination is known as Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. So now you know that Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is associated with herpes zoster virus infection and involves the uh, ear canal and the facial nerve. Next, we shall discuss human herpes virus type 4, which is also known as Epstein-Barr virus. Now, this virus has a variety of important manifestations, some of which include infectious mononucleosis, hairy leukoplakia, Burkitt's lymphoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and some forms of Hodgkin's lymphoma. And we shall discuss each one of them in the next slides. Epstein-Barr virus infection can be seen in children as well as adults. Uh, in children, the route of infection is saliva on fingers, toys, etc. Whereas with adolescents and adults, intimate contact is usually responsible for transmission of infection. Childhood infection with Epstein-Barr virus infection is generally asymptomatic, but in children less than four years of age, it can lead to pyrexia, lymphadenopathy, pharyngitis, marked hepatosplenomegaly, rhinitis, and cough. Whereas in children with who are more than four years old, there is a lower prevalence of hepatosplenomegaly, rhinitis, and cough. So the bottom line is that Epstein-Barr virus infection can affect young children. The most recognized form of Epstein-Barr virus infection in adults is infectious mononucleosis, which is marked by prodromal fatigue, malaise, anorexia, followed by fever, which may last for up to two weeks. In addition, there is lymphadenopathy in up to 90% of the patients, particularly involving the cervical lymph nodes. Oropharyngeal tonsillar enlargement can be seen in 80% of the patients and may be associated with suppuration and may even cause respiratory obstruction. Protted lymph node involvement may lead to facial nerve paralysis and Epstein-Barr virus infection in immunocompromised could be potentially fatal. Now, if you look at the combination of symptoms, that is fever, malaise, and lymph node enlargement, uh, this presentation is also known as glandular fever. And obviously, Epstein-Barr virus is one of the infections which is associated with glandular fever. As we shall see in the following slides, that glandular fever can be observed in a variety of conditions. So it's not specific to Epstein-Barr virus infection. Infectious mononucleosis may also present with intraoral lesions and the most well-recognized form of intraoral involvement is presence of pinpoint hemorrhages in the soft palate and hard palate region. And these may be present in 25% of the cases. However, uh, they do disappear in up to 48 hours after the infection. Glandular fever is a generic term which can be associated with a variety of conditions. It presents with fever, malaise, and lymph node enlargement. And not only Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus can lead to glandular fever, but also uh, acute stages of HIV, human herpes virus 6, toxoplasmosis, which is a protozoal infection, acute leukemia, and brucellosis can also produce glandular fever-like symptoms. Another remarkable manifestation of Epstein-Barr virus infection is oral hairy leukoplakia, which presents with white lesions characterized by hyperplasia, 
and hyperkeratosis of the oral mucosa. It primarily involves the lateral borders of the tongue and can be bilateral. The white lesions cannot be rubbed off. Uh, however, oral hairy leukoplakia should not be confused with tobacco associated leukoplakia. It is not a premalignant lesion uh, and biopsy is often not required unless there are other risk factors. Now, oral hairy leukoplakia due to Epstein Barr virus infection is one of the most common uh, oral manifestations of HIV infection. Uh, but it can also be seen in uh, patients who are Im immunocompromised due to immunosuppressive therapy like organ transplant patients. Uh, generally, no treatment is required, but some resolution can be obtained with um, antiviral drugs like acyclovir or retinoids. However, the lesions tend to recur following uh, discontinuation of the therapy. Now the important thing to remember is that oral hairy leukoplakia in HIV is not caused by HIV. It is the immunosuppression in HIV which leads to uh, increased risk of EBV infection and it is EBV which causes oral hairy leukoplakia likewise in other immunocompromised patients. Another rare but well-recognized manifestation of Epstein-Barr virus infection is Burkitt's lymphoma. Uh, it's a rare but aggressive type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which originates from B lymphocytes, and more than 90% cells uh, of the tumor exhibit antigens to Epstein-Barr virus, and the antibody teeters against EBV are high in patients with Burkitt's lymphoma. It's mainly seen in children and tends to involve the jaws. It's a very aggressive malignancy with generally a poor prognosis uh, and requires intensive chemotherapy. Epstein-Barr virus infection is also associated with chronic fatigue syndrome, even though the association is weak and possibly controversial. Chronic fatigue syndrome is widely reported in the UK and as the name indicates, presents with chronic fatigue, fever, myalgias, headaches, depression, and also pharyngitis. Next, we shall discuss cytomegalovirus, which is human herpes type 5 virus. Uh, this virus resides latently in the salivary gland, endothelium, macrophages, and lymphocytes, and reactivation is possible under favorable conditions for the virus primarily immunosuppression. The high risk groups for cytomegalovirus infection in infants, infection could be transmitted through placenta during delivery or breastfeeding. In adolescents, sexual contact is the main route of infection. In addition, blood transfusion, immunosuppression, organ transplantation uh, are high risk groups for cytomegalovirus infection and approximately 50% of the population is exposed to cytomegalovirus. Neonatal infection with cytomegalovirus could lead to hepatosplenomegaly, extramedullary erythropoiesis, thrombocytopenia that is reduced platelet count with petechial hemorrhages. Uh, a complication is encephalitis which may lead to mental retardation and motor deficits and importantly as dental professionals uh, we need to know that developmental enamel hypoplasia may be associated with neonatal uh, cytomegalovirus infection and it's not unique to cytomegalovirus uh, maternal viral infections are known to cause enamel hypoplasia Acute uh, cytomegalovirus infection in adults shares many features with infectious mononucleosis caused by Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, both can be transmitted through intimate contact and kissing and both present with features of glandular fever that is fever, malaise, 
lymphadenopathy, although pharyngitis and lymphadenopathy are less common in cytomegalovirus infection compared to infectious mononucleosis. In addition, there could be development of oral mucosal ulcerations. And in regards to laboratory tests, uh, patients can show abnormal liver function tests and atypical peripheral lymphocytes. Type 6 human herpes virus doesn't have a specific name. It's a T-cell lymphotropic virus and contracted within first two years of life via the oropharyngeal route. And then it usually remains latent till adult life. Reactivation may cause a febrile illness with a macular papillar rash on the face or trunk uh, and may produce glandular fever-like syndrome. Rarely, there could be development of erythematous papules on the soft palate known as Nagayama's spots. Um, what you need to remember with HHP6 is that it may be associated with uh, multiple sclerosis, which is a demyelinating disorder and leads to a variety of sensory and motor deficits. And you would also know that patients with multiple sclerosis may develop trigeminal neuralgia. Human herpes virus type 7 is a T-cell lymphotropic virus. That is, it resides in the T lymphocytes. It doesn't have any classical manifestations on the face or oral cavity. Uh, but along with human herpes virus 6, it can lead to rashes in young children. Uh, these rashes may involve the trunk, the dorsal aspect of the trunk in particular. And the term roseola or xanthum subitum is used for this type of involvement following human herpes type 7 infection. I've just included it for the sake of completeness. Human herpes type 8 is also known as Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus. So now you know that it can lead to the development of Kaposi sarcoma, which is a vascular neoplasm. And in the head and neck region, uh, it primarily involves the uh, maxilla and the palate, but cutaneous lesions are also seen throughout the body. Uh, it is particularly common in immunocompromised individuals, uh, so HIV, organ transplant patients, and you can read more about this. Uh, also, human herpes type 8 virus is associated with sarcoidosis. Uh, the association isn't as strong as with Kaposi's sarcoma, but you can read more about sarcoidosis, which is basically a multisystemic granulomatous disease, particularly involving the respiratory tract and the lymph nodes, but it can involve other organs like the kidneys, the heart, uh, eyes, and also the salivary glands. So you can read more about sarcoidosis but for the purpose of this presentation, you should know the association of human herpes virus with Kaposi sarcoma and sarcoidosis. Next, we shall briefly look at the principles of diagnosis of uh, infection with human herpes virus group. Uh, clinical assessment is the mainstay of diagnosis in most cases. You would look at the patient's history and the oral and systemic manifestations. Uh, most acute viral infections present with a febrile illness involving fever, malaise, lethargy, anorexia. And then you would be able to identify specific findings on clinical examination. For example, uh, a young child presenting with gingival inflammation, bleeding, oral ulcerations, accompanied by fever is most likely to be indicative of uh, primary herpes simplex infection. Similarly, an elderly person presenting with unilateral crusted lesions in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve accompanied by severe pain is most likely to represent shingles or varicella zoster infection. Similarly, uh, 
adults presenting with glandular fever like uh, symptoms uh, may be infected with either Epstein Barr virus infection or cytomegalovirus infection, and then more specific lesions such as uh, bilateral white lesions on the tongue could be indicative of uh, uh, oral hairy leukoplakia secondary to Epstein Barr virus infection. In terms of laboratory investigations, uh, one of the routine investigations is a full blood count uh, to identify evidence of increased leukocyte count. So increased TLC total leukocyte count and with viral infections, uh, the differential leukocyte count is most likely to show uh, increased lymphocytic count or lymphocytosis. Cytology could be undertaken uh, on occasions to demonstrate uh, oral ulceration uh, and acanthalysis, fluid accumulation in the uh, oral mucosal tissues. And then three sets of tests, which are not done routinely, uh, but may be indicated in immunocompromised patients or patients presenting with relentless non-resolving infections. The viral antibody teeters, two tests are commonly used, either the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay or ELISA or Western blot analysis. Obviously, we are not going to go into the details of how these tests are performed. That is beyond the scope of this presentation. But so that you know that ELISA and Western blot analysis assay are to assess the antibody teeters against specific viruses. Similarly, detection of antigens could be done by sandwich assay or competition assay. And one of the most recognized tests is PCR which detects viral nucleic uh, acids. And again, it's very specific. Uh, lastly, viral culture. Viral culture is extremely expensive and challenging uh, technically, and it's mainly reserved for research. Finally, we shall look at the principles of treatment of human herpes viral infections. Symptomatic management remains the mainstay of treatment for most patients. Uh, Use of non-aspirin-based analgesics and antipyretics such as paracetamol to manage fever uh, is the preferred option. Uh, you should avoid use of aspirin-based analgesics in children due to the risk of development of Ray syndrome, which can be complicated with hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, and then fluids to address dehydration bed rest and isolation. For oral lesions uh, such as ulcers, erosions, etc., uh, maintenance of good oral hygiene and use of antimicrobial agents such as chlorhexidine to prevent secondary infection is recommended. And for pain relief, you can use analgesic mouthwashes and gels, uh, sprays such as Diflam oral rinse or spray or Bongella. Uh, topical antivirals such as topical acyclovir or Zovirax cream can be applied to cold sores. Uh, immunocompromised patients may require more aggressive treatment with systemic antiviral agents uh, and the use of vaccines. For further reading, uh, you may consolidate uh, your understanding of human herpes viral infections uh, from a clinical guide to oral medicine by Lewis. That's a good text on uh, oral medicine topics. Also clinical problem in solving in dentistry by Edward Dudell has a very good case on acute herpes simplex infection. Uh, and finally, uh, this paper provides a very good review on oral herpes viral infections. Uh, you can order it through the library.